Okay, yeah, let me um, let me go over a couple a uh, couple things. So I sent this announcement out, but um, but yeah, uh, th these are a few changes. You know, as as we uh, approach the uh, the end of you know summer session A, um, you know I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to make your life miserable or anything. So anyway, um, just a couple things. Uh, homework three will extend the deadline to uh, to Friday, and uh, and I just updated the um, the due dates on canvas uh, and stuff uh, and I'll, I'll release homework five and that will be due um, we'll make that due Sunday July 31 so uh, so make sure you get some uh, time to work on that uh, and then we're just gonna kind of scratch homework five um, I'll, I'll put put we'll leave homework five existing in the gradebook but I'll just go ahead and give everybody a hundred percent on homework five okay um, we had this the the vote and a bunch of you voted and um, you know it was ended up being kind of like a 70 75 25 75 25 something around there basically a three to one um, with uh, with people voting for the Kaggle competition uh, and you know when I when I offered that thing you know it, it was intended to be kind of a, a lower stress, alternative for the final exam but you know based on some of the comments and um and things that people uh wrote um then i realized you know people were quite worried about the kaggle competition and and basically um this, this first kaggle competition the one where you're looking at election data and stuff like that uh, all of that's going to remain unchanged and i know um students are nervous about the six percent um you know, being um, attributed to the um, kind of the ranking uh, basis. Um, and, you know, I, I know it kind of feels like a lot, but um, I guess I did want to put some weight to the, the performance aspect of it. Um, that is going to be, uh, I think a lot of times how, you know, how we evaluate and how we choose models uh, that that's going to play play a role. So um, so anyway, the the first competition that's going to remain unchanged. The due date for the first competition for the um, the submissions of the scores or the the values for the competition is Wednesday. Okay, so that's Wednesday, July twenty seventh, eleven fifty nine, and then. Uh, I forget the exact due date for the um, for the report, uh, but but basically everything regarding the first competition is unchanged. Regarding the second competition, um, we will make the comp competition aspect of it just worth one percentage point. Okay, just uh, a minimal amount of motivation to make sure your your models are working well. Okay, as in a we we want them to to classify um, the values accurately, and so just a, a small uh, value there. Um, the report will be worth twenty percent, and then um, to make so that that's going to remain unchanged, and then to make up kind of the reduction in the competition port part, um, we're going to give everyone a free four percentage points there. All right, um, I've. I've settled on a data set. It's uh, it's going to be a quite a simple data set. There's a, there's the risk of it being a little bit too simple, but um, but I think uh, I think it's okay. Um, but uh, it takes a little bit of time to get uh, the the page set up on Kaggle. So uh, I'm working on that, and then as soon as I get that worked on or uh, completed uh, and uploaded. Um, I will post a link so you can expect that uh, today. And then we'll um, we'll leave uh, the competition aspects, competition portion of um, you know submitting your predictions and stuff. That will go until uh, Friday 11:59, and then you can kind of polish your report and stuff. Um, because the data set's going to be simpler, um, I'll have to modify kind of the report requirements. Um, you, you won't be able to produce as many charts or graphs, and there's just going to be a lot less 
to have to talk about or write about um, regarding the uh, the second data set just because it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot simpler there. So um, so hopefully this this thing it'll it won't it'll feel fairly manageable um, once once you uh, once you try it out and. Um, I don't know. Any questions regarding uh, some of the changes that uh, that I'm making here? You know, I understand. Um, you know, nobody likes last minute changes, and so I apologize for that. Um, but again, all of these changes are intended to kind of make your life a little bit easier rather than uh, more stressful. Okay. Uh, do we use APA format for citations? I mean, I don't care. <laughs> Just just make them um, like reasonably, uh, yeah, you know, what, whatever you want to do for, um, for citations, that's fine. If you want to just kind of throw in footnotes, um, that's, uh, that's that. Is there a page limit for the report? Um, what did I say? I said 20, uh, 20 pictures max. So I think the longest part of, um, so regarding the, uh, the report, the biggest part of the report is going to be, um, probably the, the pictures <laughs> for exploratory data analysis. And I wrote maximum 20. So if you did like one picture per page, this part will be like 20 pages. I imagine the introduction will be like one page maximum, okay? And then, um, you know, recipes, maybe maybe one, one page, maybe two pages, okay? Candidate models, I guess this will depend how many uh, models you attempt, okay? But, um, but really, you'll, you'll have a kind of a big table here. So I imagine, you know, maybe you try like a dozen models or something. Okay. Um, so maybe a couple pages here, right? Cause, cause I don't need, I don't need like paragraphs describing, <laughs> like you don't have to tell me what linear discriminant analysis is or something, right? You can just say, yeah, we did a LDA model and these are the parameters we've chosen. You don't, you don't need to explain to me, you know, this is how, um, linear regression works and that we're trying to minimize whatever the, you know, the sum of scores residuals, just tell me you're going to do a linear regression model, you know, using this thing, or you're going to do GLM net or something, just, just a brief thing. Um, I guess the, the maximum would probably be something like 25 pages. I, I don't expect anybody to be submitting anything that long anyway. Um, you know, my advice, being concise, <laughs> is uh, is is going to be uh, is better for you. Okay, so um, kind of um, I don't know. Any any questions about what what's expected in your report? Um, so you know, any kind of data visualizations? I just you know. I guess I want you to have put a little bit of thought into the things that you decide to put in there. Don't just give me every single graph you ever created um, if it's not super useful. <laughs> okay. If uh, if that that graph was informative as far as you deciding to uh, to use that um, variable, then uh, then include it. Okay. So um, you know. The tidy modeling with R, I think they do a, a pretty decent job. So, you know, we're looking at feature engineering with recipes and what are some of the different graphs that they're using. Okay. So here, here's one where they kind of show the different categories and they say, you know what, these ones have very little representation and that's why we're making an other category. Okay. Um, here we see different slopes and that's why they decided to include interactions. Um, here we see, you know what, um, if you look at the latitude, maybe a linear relationship isn't best, but maybe some kind of spline fit 
All right. So all of the graphs graphics that they put in here um, informed some of the uh, the decisions that they made regarding the recipe that they created. Certainly, they could have included more graphics, um, but at the same time, you know they didn't show us like they also explored this relationship and that relationship and it wasn't very interesting. So um, we didn't pursue it, right? So any kind of thing where you feel like, you know, the reason why we're gonna try out, um, you know, like a natural spline and um, as part of our recipe, you know, show a little bit like, oh, okay, this is, this is part of the reason why, right? Now, some of the stuff that you're gonna try out, you're gonna just try out just to, to try it out, right? It's not necessarily, um, not necessarily you saw something in the data and therefore it tried, you tried it out, but you know, the, the exploratory and the modeling, you know, it all kind of works together, right? The exploration and the modeling um, a lot of it works together. You explore something, you notice something interesting, and you say, well, I wonder if my model will be improved if I kind of take this into account, right? And then other times you just say, well, you know what? I can, let's just try this out, right? One of these models I can try out and I don't, you know, <laughs> let's just throw it in there and just see what happens. And sometimes you throw it in there and see what happens and it, and it works out. And, but a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times, um, your model, the models are made better by kind of exploring the data, asking some questions, thinking about it and saying like, you know, what, what makes sense, right? You know, I, if I were thinking about this housing data set, I probably wouldn't even thought of including latitude and longitude as, um, as a variable in, um, uh, and the thing, because I wouldn't have thought, you know, I mean, I, I don't know anything about the city <laughs> aims too much, but, you know, I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that the, uh, the price of the home really depended on whether it was north or south in the city. But, you know, the authors kind of had that idea and they, they explored it and said, no, you know what, sure enough, maybe, maybe could, um, could try, we could try it out. So, so that's, that's something in there, right? So I, I guess... What I don't want is somebody to just be like, okay, let's just create a scatter plot of <laughs> every single X variable against the, um, the Y variable and just, uh, just try every single thing out um, where I, I don't know if that's gonna be particularly uh, interesting. Okay, you can try out all of those things during your own exploration, but don't include every single one in the report, okay? Um, okay, does that kind of make sense? Any questions? All right, so I'll, um, I'll modify uh, basically the report for the classification problem just because, because the data is simpler, you probably won't be able to do as much um, exploration. It'll, <laughs> so, um, the, the report for the simpler data set will be shorter, okay? Um, and, uh, okay. Um, I, I guess to say, kind of going along with that, is that the grading criteria for the shorter report both of them, I think the report is worth 20%, but the grading criteria for the shorter report will probably be a bit more lenient. So as far as, you know, where your efforts and stuff should be going, put it in this, the, the first one on the election data, and then um, um, I mean, I imagine this will require more time and then your, uh, you know, the competition performance is worth more here, okay? Uh, this one should be, if you use the election data outline as a starting point, it should be easier to create this thing. Uh, you can kind of just pare it down to, um, to fit the, uh, the shorter data that, uh, that I'm showing here. 
Okay. Um, all right. Well, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, what we are covering today. Uh, we're going to look at decision trees and random forests. I've updated some of this to work with tidy models. Um, some of it is still hasn't been updated for tidy models. There is a lot of resources regarding random forests, decision trees. So if you go on to tidy models and you look at Parsnip for all of these different um, resources, you can see there's all kinds of trees, right? So you have bagged trees, you have boosted trees, okay? And, uh, and boosted trees will use XGBoost, which is um, uh, quite a powerful uh, engine. You have also just plain old decision trees, which we'll start off with. And then we have uh, random forest. So let's, um, let's, let's start and talk, uh, take a look at decision trees. And, um, and then we'll expand uh, based off of from there. All right, so a, the way we use a decision tree Question, would it be possible to have a relatively shorter homework for LOL? Um, I'll, I'll think about it, all right? Let me, um, let me think about what, what we need to do. What I wanna kind of cover on homework for, I, I understand there's a lot of stuff getting um, this last week, right? You've got the election data, you've got the second project, and then you'll have homework for. So um, I'll, I'll keep all of that in mind, all right? Um, the, uh, okay, so regarding decision trees, um, what we do is we partition our data, okay? So we take all of our data and we just kind of split it into different um, into different parts. We create a, a binary split using a simple rule. Um, if the variable that we're gonna split, use, use to split is a, a numeric, then we just say, hey, is X greater than some value or X less than some value K? And that will create two branches. And then on the other hand, if we have categories, then um, then we're going to say, okay, if X belongs to category A or B, then that's going to form one split. And if X belongs to categories C or D, that forms the other, um, the other split. Okay. And we keep kind of splitting or partitioning the data until we reach some kind of stopping criterion. And after all the different partitions are made, then, um, then all the observations that fall in that terminal node share a single predicted value, okay? There are different types of decision trees, um, but broadly speaking, we're just gonna say we've got regression trees, which will predict a numeric value, and we have classification trees, which predict a categorical value, okay? Um, as far as creating um, a split, okay? So we're gonna look at regression trees, um, the, the tree considers basically every single possible split or every single possible partition. And um, most algorithms are greedy in that it's going to choose the best performing split at that moment in time, which may or may not be the um, best performing split overall, but just at that moment, it is the best performing split. And so, um, um, so that's, that's what it's gonna do. And we're gonna measure our performance by choosing um, the split that minimizes the residual sum of squares of the data after making the split, okay? So one thing to note about trees is that if your final tree, let's say has a total of um, four branches or something, or uh, then <laughs> your regression model. So let me. Uh, so if your if your tree looks like this, okay, 
your tree is only capable of making four unique predictions, <laughs> which, which seems a little bit silly, um, but that's it, okay? It's only able to, if, if this is what your tree looks like. So however many terminal nodes, that's how many unique predictions your tree can, can make. So if this is a numeric value, numeric variable that we're predicting, then we're either gonna predict something is, you know, 10 or 15 or 17 or 25, okay? And that's it. And it's not possible, you know, if we have, if we're gonna predict, what did I say? 10, 15, 17 and 25, our tree is never gonna predict the value 13. It's never gonna predict the value 22. It's only gonna predict one of these four values depending on how, how you answer these questions. Now you can make your tree deeper and have more and more splits. But again, however many final terminal nodes you have, that's how many unique values you can possibly predict. Here is um, an old <laughs> decision tree that was uh, published back in 2008. Um, this, there was a, when, um, we know how the election turned out. Uh, Obama won uh, the presidency uh, in 2008, but at the time there was a primary, a Democratic primary um, between Obama and Clinton. Uh, they were both kind of running for president. And this was early on in 2008 where the, uh, the primaries were being performed. Um, and uh, it was, I don't remember, the exact date, but um, but basically about half of the primaries had had run, and so um, they were trying to predict based on based on the um, primary elections that had happened so far what's going to happen in the the remaining primary elections and who's going to win the uh, who's going to win the primary and then who's going to win the, uh, the the final vote and so. Um, at the time they were trying to figure, um, and basically this decision tree um, looked at different demographic counties, all right? So um, kind of similar to the, the project that, uh, that you are working on now, um, looking at different um, uh, demographic uh, aspects of some of these counties, all right? So, you know, they said, it, is a county more than 20% black? And if so, then um, it says Obama wins these counties 383 to 70. And if not, then they ask other questions. Is the high school graduation rate higher than 78%? Um, it, and if the answer is no or yes or something like that, is the high school graduation rate higher than 87%? And, um, and looking at that, this is how the, um, the decision tree was split. So this was you know back in two, 2008, and this was published in the New York Times. Um, and, you know, that's, it's just kind of interesting. It's also, you know, now that it's 14 years ago, it's also a little bit of an interesting political relic. Because I think if you, if we covered up who, <laughs> who the, uh, the people are here, I think when you look at these questions, um, you know, who we think, uh, I don't know if we would expect uh, Clinton to be um, the, the candidate that, the, that we're talking about in these, uh, in these things. Um, so to kind of illustrate this, we'll take a look at uh, a very simple toy example of a uh, toy data set. And uh, using this, we'll, um, we'll kind of go through the process of making a decision tree, all right? And so my X values go one, two, three, four, five, and my Y values, I have one, one, three, seven, and eight. And we're gonna ask, where should I put the first split for my decision tree, okay? And so with, um, with our predictor variable being numeric, we're gonna look for a numeric value where we're gonna partition uh, our X values. And so, um, so our baseline, is having no partition. Our baseline is just saying, okay, everybody belongs to one bucket, okay? And in that case, we take 
um, all the y values, one, one, three, seven, and eight, we add those up, we get uh, 20, and 20 divided by five, we get a mean of four. So with no partition, um, we would just predict the mean for all the values. That would be kind of the safest value to predict. And so we get, um, we get a mean of four. And then we're going to ask, what is the sum of squared residuals, the RSS, the uh, for our predictions? So you know we subtract off four from everything and we square them. Okay, so we have um, this first value is one. One minus four is negative three. Negative three squared is nine. Same thing with this one. This one's a one. Residual three. We square that. We get nine. The actual value is three. 3 minus 4, 1, 1 squared is 1, 7 minus 4 is 3, 3 squared is 9, and 8 minus 4 is 4, and 4 squared is 16. So if you add all of these up, you get an RSS of 44. So that's, that's our first, um, the total RSS. And we want to know, well, can we put in a split that's going to reduce uh, the RSS? So we're going to consider every single possible split. Oh, so here's a diagram illustrating the residuals. And basically, we're squaring these residuals. Uh, we're going to consider every single possible partition. So our x values go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And so we're going to first try splitting x between 1 and 2. Okay, We're going to split x at between 1 and 2. And so on one side, if um, if we're going to say, is x greater than or less than 1.5? And if x is less than 1.5, um, then the value we're going to predict is going to be 1. OK? So we look at the values less than um, that correspond to x less than 1.5. We have one value for y, which is 1. So we're going to predict 1. And we have no residual there, right? So r squared there is 0. On the side for x greater than 1.5, the values are 1, 3, 7, and 8. And if we take the mean of that, we get 4.75. And we can calculate the residuals and square them. And we get um, you know, 14, 3, 5, 10. And we add them up and we get 32.75. This is the sum of squared residuals um, for this particular split. Okay, And the way this diagram looks, is we're going to say, okay, we're going to form a split at 1.5. Values lower than 1.5 get the prediction 1. Values where x is greater than 1.5 gets the prediction uh, 4. Point, what was it? 4.75. And these are the residuals there. Okay. And so the squared residuals we have here is 32.75. Okay. Um, we consider every single possible split. The next one, we're going to split uh, between um, x is 2 and y is uh, x is 3. And for, um, for values of x less than 2.5, then the, the y values are 1 and 1. And so we would predict 1. And we our residuals there are 0. And 0 squared is 0. Okay. For values greater than 2.5, the values are 3, 7, and 8. Um, the mean of 3, 7, and 8 is 6. And these would be the squared residuals. So we would have, you know, the actual value is 3. We predicted 6. So residual is 3. 3 squared is 9. And so on and so forth. And so um, the total sum, uh, RSS for this split is 14. So values less than 2.5, where x is less than 2.5, we have no residuals. We predicted those perfectly. For values of x greater than 2.5, we're going to have a total RSS of 14. So the total RSS of this whole split is 14. Okay, we'll, um, we'll consider the next split. We partition between x3 and x4. We're going to look at 3.5 will be our dividing line. And if we do that and partition A, the mean of these values for y, 1, 1, and 3, it's going to be 1.667. We, um, we take those differences and we square them. And we get 0 0.44, 0 0.44, and 1.77. And then on the side where uh, x is greater than 
we have seven and eight. And so our predicted value will be the mean of those 7.5. Those residuals are 0.5 and 0.5. 0.5 squared is 0.25. And so when you take the total of the um, RSS there, we get 3.1667, right? So these are the residuals we have when we split at 3.5. Down here, we're predicting 1.667 and we have some residuals here. Up here, we're predicting seven and a half and we have some residuals here. And then lastly, um, we'll try splitting. Uh, the last possible split is between four and five on X. And again, and in this case, we would predict the value three. This is the mean of these values. And we would predict the value eight. There's no residual here, but we've got some big residuals here. And so the total RSS of this split is 24. So considering all of the possible splits, we have um, with five unique values of X, we have four potential splits. The one that performs the best, the one that reduces the RSS the most is this one, right? So the total RSS after the split is 24. The total RSS after this split is 3.167. Total RSS after the split is 14. And the total RSS after this split is 32.75. So the best performing split is the one where the total RSS is only 3.167. We're splitting between three and four. And so that is what, um, this is the resulting um, diagram that we get. We're gonna split between X at three and four. And um, um, this is what our decision tree is gonna look like, okay? So based on this, we would create a split between X is x equals three and x equals four. Uh, that re results in the greatest reduction in the RSS. So if we wanted to try this in R, there are a few things. Oh, sorry, this is still uh, kind of my old, old notes. Um, I, I need to update that to say we're going to, you know, we can use tidy models. Um, but here this uh, uses R part. I've created a data frame where x is one, two, three, four, five. Y takes on the values one, one, three, seven, and eight. And I can say R part, um, predict Y based on X. And it creates a split at X less than 3.5 versus X greater than or equal to 3.5. And for X less than 3.5, the value that it predicts is 1.6667. For X greater than 3.5, the value it predicts is 7.5. The total RSS, on this side is 2.666. The total RSS over here is 0.5 for total RSS of 3.167. So these are kind of the results um, that we've I'm tried to explain. So um, I guess the root node, there's an originally five observations and the total uh, RSS for the original bucket is 44 and uh, I saw that right here, right? So when we, um, when we have everything in one bucket, the total RSS is 44. And that's, that's reflected here. And the value that we're predicting for that bucket is four. But if we create a split, this is where the split would be, X less than 3.5, we would have three observations in that bucket and um, the total RSS, for, for it is 2.667, and the value we're predicting would be 1.66. And that's, uh, that's, that's what it's saying. Okay, you can call summary and you get these uh, CP values, complexity parameter is the um, um, value that it's looking at, um, but basically it gives you an analysis of some of the splits. We'll, uh, I'll take a look at it in a moment here, okay? Uh, but one thing we see reg regarding this complexity parameter, it says its score is 0 0.928, 0 0.928, or the improvement here is 0 0.928. Now, how did we get that number, All right? Well, before the split, the RSS of the five data points was 44. After splitting, the RSS was reduced to 3.1667. So how much was it reduced, okay? Well, I went from 44 down to 3.167, which is a reduction of 
40.83 divided by 44 will give you 0.928, okay? That's how we're getting this number. It's what percentage of the RSS was reduced by including that split. And we reduced it by 90, 93%, which is, a, which is a very effective split. Okay, if we wanted to do tidy models and make a decision tree with tidy models, I'll load up library tidy models and I can create a model, decision tree model, and we can give it a few arguments. Here, I'm gonna say the minimum number of observations required to consider a split is going to be five minimum and and uh, here, let me just go ahead and look up decision trees here so this is kind of the, the reference on parsnip regarding decision trees the default engine is our part but there's um, other engines available as well and um, you can provide a few arguments like the cost complexity, tree depth, or minimum n. So here I've created, uh, I specified minimum n to equal five. And again, a lot of these things you can have tuned or you can kind of choose manually yourself as well. So um, I'm gonna set the engine to our part. And then one thing about decision trees is you have to set the mode because decision trees can be used for uh, predicting a numeric value in regression, or it could be used to predict a categorical value for classification. So, um, so anyway, I created my model, and then we, we're going to fit it to our data. In our case, our data set the very simple DF. We're going to predict Y based on X. And uh, once I do this, it says, here's your parsnip model object, and we get the same output here did when we called our part, okay? So when we called our part on this, which is, you know, naturally we would expect kind of the same thing because it's using the same engine, but um, it doesn't require, because if you want to use our part, you would have to look up basically our part.control and then learn how to specify the arguments there. Whereas I think with tidy models, I'm, I, I hope at this point we feel okay kind of reading how models are created using tidy models. And I think this is, this is pretty straightforward here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's decision trees, okay? Now, if, um, if we had a larger data set, and we'll, um, we'll take a look at a larger data set in a moment here, the, the algorithm would consider every single possible partition across every single, um, every single variable, okay? And so if you have very large data sets, um, trees and forests and stuff like that can take a, take a while to, um, to run because it has a, a lot of different possible splits to consider, okay? So for example, if we had five variables and 100 split, uh, 100 observations, there would be a total of 495 partitions to consider for that very first split because um, first variable there with 100 observations, there would be 99 possible places to do a split. And uh, we would consider 99 possible places for the uh, first variable, 99 possible places for the second variable. And we're gonna keep track of all kind of 495 possible partitions. And out of all possible partitions, we're gonna choose the one that, um, maximizes the reduction in RSS. We go for the greedy split. So, um, so if you have, you know, 10,000 observations, then you basically have 9,999 possible partitions for every single variable. And so if you have, you know, 100 variables, 10,000 observations, you know, you're, you're on the order of considering a million different possible partitions. And, um, and so you can see this, this can be quite computationally expensive. Okay. And then after you perform that split, after you perform that split, then um, now you basically have two data sets and you're gonna perform the same task recursively. 
So you're going to take the smaller data set. So if you have, if you start off with 100 observations, maybe the split splits it into 40 and 60. And so now you're going to take one side, which has 40 observations, and then you're going to consider all possible splits there. And you kind of do this recursively until you reach some kind of stopping criterion. Um, so you just, you know, it's like cutting, <laughs> cutting the cake in half. And then once you have it in a smaller piece, then you say, okay, what do I do? You know, I'm going to cut it again. And you keep cutting it until you say, all right, um, I'm done. Okay. Uh, we have some kind of stopping criterion. The stopping criterions are often um, you reach a minimum number of observations in a bucket. You say, you know what? Um, once my bucket has less than five observations, don't consider doing any more splits. Okay. Or you can say, once we reach four levels deep, don't consider any more splits. Okay. So you can, uh, you can kind of specify some of these um these options so these are kind of different stopping criterions you can say the minimum number in my buckets need to be uh some number before we consider a split um or uh so uh the tree depth is the uh, maximum depth of the tree okay and then uh cost complexity um is um going to be used to kind of decide is this tree worth considering or is this split worth considering? It's only worth considering if it's improvement in RSS is over a certain number, okay? And so, um, so we can try, um, so I'll, I'll show you how we can kind of revise a tree by changing the cost com complexity here, okay? So um, using kind of our part, control, we can specify these things, min split two and cost complexity parameter being 0 0.01. And we get this tree that's overfit, okay? Um, using uh, tidy models, I would do something like this, decision tree, minimum number to consider a split would be two. And the cost complexity, um, it just has to be 0 0.01, okay? And, and if I do that, then the final tree, um, we have four different, four terminal nodes, okay? Each, each star represents a terminal node. And basically, if we, if we look at the original data set Y, there were only um, four unique values. We had one, one, three, seven, and eight. And so I have a terminal node for each unique value of one, three, seven, and eight, which, which is not a great tree. We've, oh, we've overfit the data in our tree, okay? So the tree produces four terminal nodes equivalent to the number of unique Y values. This overfits the data. And so to decrease the overfitting, we can prune the tree um, by kind of removing the weakest link one at a time until a tree of a desired complexity is reached, right? So, so right now, the first split, we split at less than three or greater than three point, uh, less than 3.5 or greater than 3.5. If it's less, if X is less than 3.5, we consider another split at X less than 2.5 or greater than 2.5. And if it's greater than 3.5, we consider another split at X less than 4.5 or X greater than 4.5. Which of these should we get rid of? Should we get rid of this split or should we get rid of this split first? Okay. Well, um, so if we take a look at this, um, so the, this is the output. We might consider getting rid of one of these one of these splits. Um, we can see that uh, prior to this split, the RSS of the side where X is greater than 3.5, the total RSS is 0.5. And after the split, it goes from 0.5 down to zero. So we, we have reduced the RSS. Whereas this split goes from 2.6 down to zero. And so including this split reduces the RSS a little bit more, okay? So the, the split at 2.5 reduces the RSS by 2.6. 
the split at 4.5 reduces the RSS by 0.5, okay? So as far as um, what proportion we're reducing, okay, 2.6 is around 6%, and um, 0.5 is uh, just over 1%. And so um, we're gonna say, you know what, this is the weaker split. This one reduces the RSS by only 1%. And so um, this would be the weakest link, okay? We can call summary to see also, that I can do um, take the parsnip model after I fit it, which I've called bad tree fit. And we can run extract fit engine and call summary on it to kind of get the classical summary view here. And we can see um, these are the, the, the splits that we're considering. The first split reduced it by 93%, 92.928. The next split reduces 6%. The last split reduces by about 1.1%. And kind of uh, the, the baseline, the minimum amount that we would re consider reduction would be 0.01. That was, that was specified um, back here when we created our model. So, um, and here it talks about um, each of these different nodes and the associated complexity parameter, they are the same that, that appear here as well, right? So a lot of information in this summary, but all to say, if I choose a complexity parameter larger than 0 0.01, but less than 6%, then it will eliminate this split. So going back, I can create a, um, a tree version two, all right? And I can bump my complexity parameter up to say 2%, right? And if I do that, then, um, oh, you can't see it, but, uh, but it gets rid of that, the, the node down here. It got cut off here, okay? So if I bump up my complexity parameter to say 2%, it, it won't create the, any nodes where the, the reduction in RSS is less than 2%. And then if I bump it up further, so if I bump up my complexity parameter to something over 6%, so here I, I chose 0.1, okay? Then it won't create any splits that result in a uh, reduction less than 10%. So in this case, it, um, it doesn't create this split either. This split had a, performance level of 6%. Um, and if I do that, then it removes that node. And now we're left with kind of the original tree where there's only one split. So this, this, these are kind of, if you are manually creating your decision tree and specifying all of these um, parameters yourself. Okay. You know, I've, I've forgotten to give you any of my view quiz answers. Let me give you your first view quiz answer. Today's first view quiz answer is the letter B. B as in bear. B is your first view quiz answer. All right. Um, here is an example where we're going to just try using a slightly more complicated data set. This one, we're looking at um, a data set on vehicles uh, as reported by Consumer Reports. And so here I'm gonna create a decision tree. I didn't specify any of the, um, the parameters here. And, um, and we'll just, and in this case, we're gonna try to predict price based on a few uh, variables that appear in the data set, okay? These, these were arbitrarily chosen, um, but uh, mileage will be kind of, um, you know, it's a driving performance and the type is, you know, is it a compact car or a small car or something? Country of origin um, is a thing, okay? And, um, and so I fit the data or fit the model to the data. And then we're just gonna take a look at uh, the summary of this model after I fit. And this will give us a sense of 
kind of some of the complexity parameters that we might want to try out. So the low, uh, the smallest complexity parameter that it will consider, uh, that it considered was going down to as low as 1%. There might be even uh, lower values that it would consider, but we're going from around 0 0.0103, so around 1%, and the largest value up here is around 0 0.25, 25%. So this gives us a sense of the kind of complexity parameter ranges that we might want to consider if we were to try to decide on a complexity parameter here. So this, this I just fit to the entire data set. Okay, and so here we're gonna try to use um, tidy models tune ability to, um, to kind of choose a complexity parameter via cross-validation, okay? And you, had, you have to do something like this for homework three as well. Um, you know, you're going to use tune, the, uh, the tune package to try to figure out, you know, some of these hyperparameters. Okay. And so kind of looking back here, we want to kind of consider complexity parameters somewhere around 1% to something around 25%, um, just to kind of get, get a range here. Now, keep in mind, this thing was fit to the entire training data set, and we're going to be doing something via cross-validation. So by default, the cost complexity um, thing in uh, tidy models uses a log 10 transformation. So we want to kind of consider values from negative 2 or 10 to the negative 2 being 0 0.01 and to something maybe like 10 to the negative 0.5, which is around 0 0.316, okay? Because we're going for around 1% to 0.25, 25%. And this will kind of give us, get us in that ballpark. Doesn't have to be exactly so, right? Um, and if you take a look at, you know, what are the dials that are available for us, we can look at, you know, what are the some of the different hyperparameters that we could um, create, uh, you know, dial in here. Uh, one is complexity parameter, but we could also try um, tree depth, right? And this will look for integer values from one to fifteen. Um, we can do uh, minimum n and try to dial that in hyperparameters, and we can choose integer values between two through forty, and there's other things as well. Okay, and these all kind of give you what kind of um, values to to test out. So cost complexity by default it goes from ten to the negative ten to ten to the negative one, and here I want something a little bit of a different range. I'm going to go from 10 to the negative 2 to 10 to the negative 5. So just keep in mind that sometimes the default values um, might not perform well. All right, so to um, do uh, the hyperparameter tuning here, okay, um, I'm going to create a parsnip object, right? Uh, model object, and we're going to create a decision tree. And for cost complexity, instead of putting in a value like 1% or 5% or 10%, I'm going to specify tune here. And in order for tune to work, I need to set up a grid. Okay, so I've got the decision tree. We're going to say the engine is our part, mode is regression, and we want to try out different, um, different values here. And so as far as testing out different complexity parameters, um, we're going to call the cost complexity uh, thing here. We're going to say, make a grid out of it and try out values from negative 2 to negative 0.5. Okay? Transformation, I could have left this out. This is the default value, uh, which is the log 10, again, corresponding to 10 to the negative 2 is 0.01, and 10 to the negative 0.5, you know, 1 divided by the square root of 10 is around 0.316, okay? So that's going to give, give me values here. And so if I say, all right, what does my tree grid look like? The smallest value it's going to try out for cost complexity is 0.01, and it's gonna, then it's going to try out these other values, 0 0.0147, 0 0.0215, 0 0.0316, and so on and so forth, 0 0.1, 0 0.147, 0 0.1, 0 0.215, 0 0.316, okay? 
So this is these are the values that's going to try out. All right, and then we're going to try doing cross validation. So I call vfold cross validation. In this one, I just picked an arbitrary seed, set seed ten. We're going to do vfold cross validation here, and then um, and then we create a workflow, and then we uh, run the workflow through the tuning grid. Okay, or through uh, the tune tune function. So I'm gonna so my workflow. We're gonna take the tree model that's set up for tuning. Okay, the tree tree tune has the decision tree. That's my workflow, and then uh, as far as a recipe goes, I didn't do anything. Oh, I guess um, maybe I guess I could have. Uh, added a recipe to um, to turn country into nominal variables, but I think I think it does it anyway. So here I did uh, add a formula. And then we're gonna, as far as uh, fit them, okay, the tree results, we're gonna take the this workflow that we've created and then we run it through, um, run it through this function. And this is gonna be basically like fitting the data but it's trying to figure out what what's the best um, what's the best hyperparameter to use. Okay, so we're going to use <coughs> the cross validation folds that uh, that we created, and we're going to run it through the uh, the grid that we created. Okay, so right now there's only one variable in the grid. Um, we could have had multiple variables, right? I could have said you know let's also test out tree depth to see. Um, what we need to do, but but here we're just testing out that one variable. Okay, and then um, and then I run this through, and with the results, we're going to collect our metrics, and I'm going to just look at RMSE, and I'm going to arrange them from least to greatest. All right, and so according to this, the best performing cost complexity parameter was 0 0.0316. And its mean RMSE was 5892. Okay. And, uh, and that's what we have. And if we look at this, um, you know, we have kind of pretty close performance. These <laughs> values between 0 0.01 and 0 0.04, all kind of, if you look at the RMSE, the mean of those tenfold cross validations, Pretty close, 5892, 5926, 5964, 5985, 5985, okay? At around um, a cost complexity parameter of 0 0.0681, 0 0.1, 0 0.147, then we can see that the RMSE has worse performance, 6309, 6685, 7520, so on and so forth, okay? So based on these, uh, based on these results, I would pick the result of uh, cost complexity parameter of 0 0.0316, something around there. Um, I decided to just try this out again. Same thing, same exact thing, but this time I'm going to change the change the seed because cross validation is subject to randomness, right? So let's just try out a different seed and see what kind of results we get. So here I set a seed to 11, do the same exact thing. And when I do this, this time, the best performing cost complexity parameter was 0 0.0215 and 0 0.0316 is close behind. Now these, these numbers actually all kind of came out the same, 5603, 5603. Um, and we can see again values between 0.01 and 0.04 seem to have very similar performance 5603 to 5702 share there's there's a little bit of change there and again these these values all kind of perform the worst <laughs> so if i look at these values they these are the same values in the same order here um, these ones got kind of shuffled around a little bit kind of indicating that you know Differences between these two, these these values up here, probably not a huge difference. Okay, I tried it again with just another seed, same kind of thing. 
Okay, these values came out quite similar. These ones were consistently worse. So this is an indicator where, you know what? Complexity parameters in this range going from around 0.01 to 0.05 is probably not gonna make a huge difference. And which one's gonna perform the best? Um, something around two or 3%. We don't get the exact same values because, um, because of random sampling, right? So with, with when you do v-fold cross-validation, you get um, different folds and the performance on these different folds uh, will be different. So, you know, that's something to consider as you are testing out your, um, your different models, you might want to try different seeds for your v-fold cross-validation to kind of check to see, uh, check to see your performance, um, see if it's consistent, see if the uh, hyper parameters that you've tuned um, is consistent from, from run to run. Okay, does that kind of make sense regarding tuning the hyperparameters for a decision tree? Okay, now to be honest, we probably <laughs> don't run decision trees all, all by itself. We often will try to improve um, the, the performance of a decision tree by doing a few different things. Okay. All right. So this is where um, I haven't updated the notes to kind of reflect tidy models. Um, my hope is that by now we feel kind of okay with handling tidy, tidy models. And so, you know, if you go to Parsnip, you can see just some of the different trees that are available. We've got um, um, bagging. Uh, which we'll talk about. I don't know what BART is. Ba Bayesian additive regression trees. So this seems like something. DBARTs using the engine specific page. Okay, so apparently there's just one package that runs this and I don't know anything about it. But, um, but you can try, try uh, testing this out. Um, you, you kind of just set up these things uh, boosted trees is pretty popular. Um, and again, you create the model. Um, there's kind of default values and the, the default engine is XG boost. Um, and a lot of these things, if you wanted to, you could run tuning parameters for the um, for its, uh, to try to figure out the hyperparameter to, uh, to use. Okay, so one, one major drawback of a single decision tree is that its predictive performance just is not that great. Because again, when you have a simple tree, it's only able to make a certain number of unique predictions, okay? So in order to kind of improve the performance of a tree, one thing we can do is we can do some bagging, okay? Bagging is the idea of applying bootstrap to a decision tree, and you're gonna create multiple trees based on your bootstrapped data, okay? So you're gonna end up creating a several trees, uh, several decision trees. And then when it's time to make a prediction, you run your test observation through all of the trees. Each of the trees maybe makes a different prediction value and then you average them all together. So, um, so let's take our toy data set again. And here I'm going to do a bootstrap resample. So I'm going to take my toy data set, which had the X values one, two, three, four, five, and the Y values one, one, three, seven, and eight. Okay. And when I resample the data, I end up picking row four twice and I didn't select row one. So my X data is now two, three, four, four, five, and my Y data is one, three, seven, seven, eight. And if I fit a tree, to this, it's going to say, all right, split the data at 3.5. And the prediction when x is less than 3.5 is 2, right? So if we look at, we're going to split right here. This is one partition. Over here, we're going to predict 2 between 1 and 3. And over here, we're going to predict on this partition where x is greater than 3.5, we're going to predict 7.33. That's fine, OK? so. Values less than 3.5 are predicted to be two. Values greater than 3.5, we predict to be 7.33. Here is another random sampling. In this one, we resample our data. I happen to get 
uh, row three twice and I didn't select row two. So I have one, three, three, four, five, and Y is one, three, three, seven, eight. So when we create a decision tree on this data, we're also gonna split at 3.5. But when we split at 3.5, this is the first partition. We take the mean of one, three, and three, and we're gonna predict 2.3 for those values. Values greater than 3.5, we're gonna predict 7.5, okay? So the predictions made by this tree is slightly different from the predictions made by this tree. Here we predicted two on 7.33. Here we predict 2.33 and 7.5. Finally, I do one more bootstrap resample. And in this case, just kind of by weird coincidence, I ended up picking row one three times, one, one, and one. And I picked row four twice, four and four. This is a little bit of an odd coincidence, but it happened. And so, um, so in this case, we would split between X is one and four. So we'll, we'll just say, all right, um, halfway between is two and a half. And mm -hmm. if X is less than two and a half, we predict the value one. And if X is greater than 2.5, we predict seven, okay? So again, just a weird data set, weird resample that we get. Um, and so these are just the different, different predictions that we would make. So when it comes time to making a prediction using uh, the boosted tree, let's say we have uh, a test case where X is equal to four. We run X equal to four through all three models. So X equal to four for the first tree, uh, we say is it greater than 3.5? Yes, we're gonna predict 7.33. Next tree is greater than 3.5, so we're gonna predict 7.5. The last tree, it's greater than 2.5, we're gonna predict 7.0. So we would predict 7.33, 7.5, and seven. We take the average of these three trees and we get 7.278. That's gonna be our prediction for uh, the results um, of kind of this bagged tree system, okay? Um, again, I did not set it up with a, with tidy models here, but here you can just, uh, you can call bag tree and, um, and you can kind of try this out, okay? With, um, we probably don't do bagging uh, alone, <laughs> but uh, we probably, um, more popular is random forest, okay? So bagging randomizes the observations used in the training data, uh, random forest does a little bit more by randomizing the variables that are gonna be used in creating a tree, okay? So bagging alone, usually not recommended just because it produces trees that are a little bit too similar to one another. Um, and so, you know, one issue is that, um, if you have a predictor variable in your data set that you know performs really well, then every single every single observation or every single tree that's produced by bagging is probably going to use that one variable. Okay, just because that one variable is is um, it performs so well for the initial split. Okay. Um, and you, you might say, well, why, why is that a bad thing? Okay, well, <laughs> uh, imagine you're gonna try to, again, uh, this is a silly thing, but imagine you're trying to create a superhero team, okay? A team of superheroes. Do you, um, is your, uh, would you want a team where every single person or every, every member of the team has like the same powers, right? Maybe, uh, maybe like the greatest power is super strength or something. And, um, and, and you might say, okay, well, in order to, <laughs> um, if every single uh, team member has the same abilities, uh, just because that one superpower is like so powerful, um, I, I would say your team might not be that great. Okay. It might be better to have, uh, assemble a team where 
you know, each of the different members have different kind of strengths that kind of complement each other, right? So you might have one person who with uh, super strength, but then you might want to have somebody who is, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> able to do, you know, some something defensive, like create force fields or whatever, right? Um, and, and similarly, it's a weird analogy, but in your data set, you might have one variable that's, you know, too good of a predictor. And if you allow that variable to be used in every single tree, then, um, then that one variable is going to be kind of used for that primary split in the beginning. But if you ever run across a test case where that one variable isn't uh, a good predictor, it's um, because all of the trees use that one predictor variable, it's going to um, it's going to perform poorly. Okay, and so random forest requires that um, that the variables themselves be randomized. Okay that some trees are not allowed to use certain predictors. So we randomly, we force some of the trees that are being uh, developed to, uh, to use different variables. And, um, and that's going to kind of, uh, kind of heighten it, okay? Oh, so here's my silly analogy, all right? Let's say you're putting together a team of people to um, perform some kind of mission, all right? Um, here I wrote, if everyone has, if everyone selected for the mission has sight, it's very likely that everyone depends heavily on using vision to navigate, okay? Sight is one of the most important senses that we have, okay? Uh, however, if you do include someone who is blind on your team, then you will have someone who doesn't need or depend upon sight for navigation, but perhaps uses some of their other senses or has other techniques for uh, navigating and getting around, all right? So perhaps if you're in a novel situation where vision is not as helpful, or you have a uh, test case in your data where um, you know that that one variable isn't a, a good predictor. So you know, for example, in this case, I you end up in a very dark cave. You know, having a blind person who's able to navigate without vision could end up being very helpful. Okay, uh, so random forest we bootstrap, resample the data. And then when it comes time to fitting a tree, we choose only a random subset of the predictor variables that go into the data set. And then we fit a whole bunch of these different trees. Each tree uses a different random subset of predictor variables. And then, um, so now we have a forest of all of these different trees that look different. And then we make a prediction by averaging all of the different tree averaging all of the different trees, okay? So here's kind of a diagram of random forest, right? Here, this one's for classification, but basically you run it through one tree and it goes down this path and it makes this prediction. You run it through another tree, which has different variables and it makes this prediction. And you run it through this tree, which has different variables and it makes a different prediction. And taking all of the different predictions made by the different trees, you, uh, you either average them together for regression or you have majority voting for classification. Okay, so here um, I used kind of random forest in, um, in base, I guess the base are not tidy models and it, um, um, it does this, but here I just threw in a reference to random forest. And so I think the, the default engine is ranger and the different variables that we can use when specifying a, a model here is mtry, which is gonna be an integer value for the number of predictors that will be randomly selected. So you can say, you know, I want you to try five different variables or you're limited to three, or you're limited to you know some number. Okay, um, how many trees we should should be made? You know, like a thousand trees in the forest, five thousand trees in the forest. Who knows? Or uh, the minimum number of data points. Now you can specify these. There's some some values that you might try arbitrarily. Okay, or um, you can try to tune them 
using um, um, the, the tuning packages. Okay, and then lastly, um, we have boosting. Okay, and so boosting is creates what we call a slow slow learning trees, and it fits the residuals instead. So, um, so this is uh, random forest, and then we can also create boosted trees. And so I just wanted to kind of illustrate a little bit of how boosting works with kind of a, our toy example again. And then, um, but again, I didn't write the code for tidy models, uh, but I am hoping uh, you can figure that out as well. Okay, so with boosting, what you're going to do is you're going to fit a bunch of small trees, um, basically trees that only create one split. So you're not going to have multiple nodes. You're going to just have a whole bunch of you have a, a whole bunch of trees that just look like this, okay? You, you fit a bunch of these different <laughs> simple um, trees that with only one split. So basically like a stump is, uh, is what they call it, okay? Um, one node, two branches, and, um, and you learn, you train them sequentially. You train them on the errors, okay? So each iteration tries to uh, make, predict the, uh, the mistakes of the previous iteration. Right, so um, so when it comes for boosting, usually you have kind of this learning rate. Here I've got lambda, I think in um, what we call um, boosting. Uh, tidy models doesn't like to use just arbitrary letter names, so uh, we have learning rate. Okay, and again this can be uh, tuned, but I think that the default is a is a small number, maybe around. 1% or something, okay? The learning rate is the, the rate at which the boosting algorithm adapts from iteration to iteration, okay? And um, so for the sake of this example, we'll use, um, we'll use a lambda of, you know, 30%, 0.3, okay? In general, it's a lot smaller, right? And, um, and the number of trees that we will fit will just be two. We're gonna just have two boosted trees, but again, typically we fit a lot more. Um, and so our boosted tree model here, our toy tree model is gonna perform poorly, but it maybe gives you an idea of how uh, a boosted model works. Uh, let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer. Today's second view quiz answer is the letter E, E as an elephant. E as an elephant is your second view quiz answer. Okay, so here is our data again. X is one, two, three, four, five, and Y is one, one, three, seven, eight. And we first start by predicting the mean of four, okay? So this is kind of our baseline, and we look at our residuals. So our residuals become negative three, negative three, negative one, three, and four. Okay, so these are the residuals. And we're gonna fit a decision tree to the residuals. So if I fit a decision to the tree to the residuals, we would say, okay, create a split at 3.5 and on the left, if you're less than 3.5, the value you're gonna predict for the residuals will be negative 2.33. And the value on the right-hand side, if you're greater than X 3.5, then the value you're gonna predict over here is gonna be uh, 3.5, okay? So we're trying to predict the residuals and, uh, and this is the split. So we create the split at three and a half and we're gonna predict these values. Now, with, with boosting, we don't, um, we don't make that adjustment directly, okay? So we don't say, all right, take four and then subtract 2.3 or take four and add 3.5. We, we slow down the adjustment by using our lambda, okay? And again, lambda is usually something small, like 1%. 
But in our case, we'll um, just for the sake of illustration, we'll use a lambda of say 30%. Okay, but this still illustrates kind of what would happen. So the new prediction is, um, you know, we take our mean value four, and then we're going to add basically the lambda or our learning rate times the predicted residual. So for values less, where uh, for values in this partition where x is less than 3.5, we're predicting negative 2.33 for the residual. And we're going to multiply that by our learning rate of 30%. And so 30% of 2.33 is like 0.7. And so our predicted value is going to be 4 minus 0.7, and we're going to predict 3.3. On the, um, for this partition, okay, for the values on this side of the partition, the residuals are 3.5. And again, rather than adding 3.5 to four to get seven and a half, we're gonna multiply 3.5 by our learning rate. Okay, typically something around 1%, but here we're gonna do 30%. 30% of time 3.5 is 1.05. And so our predicted value here is going to be 5.05. Our residuals between our predicted values and, um, and the actual values of 1, 1, 3, 7, and 8, our residuals are now negative 2.3, negative 2.3, negative 0.3, 1.95, and 2.95. So these are the residuals um, after, we, um, after we fit one boosted tree. And then, so we want to try to predict these values. So looking at these values, taking those residuals, we want to fit a tree to kind of predict these values. So we're going to, um, so if I fit a tree to this, it's going to say the best location to create a split is again, going to be again at X between three and four at 3.5. And if I take the mean of these values, so splitting, you know, I've got these three observations in the top partition, these two observations in the bottom partition. So taking these three values over here, the value, um, the mean of those values is negative 1.63. And the mean of the uh, values on this side is uh, 2.45. Okay. So these are gonna be the values to predict or the residuals. So these were the, um, um, the predicted values, 3.3, and then we're gonna add, we're gonna add these, um, these adjusted values here, okay? So if I take um, 0.3 and I add negative 1.63, then the new predicted value is going to be 2.81. Okay, and, uh, and doing this, so my new predicted values are 2.81, 2.81, 5.785, and 5.785. So again, we're taking these values that, that we're predicting and we're adding them to our, um, our residuals here. And I think, um, and, um, and so, these are these are the values here. You know, I apologize. These I need to fix these numbers here. These numbers are not correct. Um, but uh, um, so our new residuals, we take negative two point three minus point three times this value, and so our residual between um, what uh, what we're predicting and what our y actually is. The difference between y and what we're predicting here is negative 1.81, this value and this value has a difference of negative 1.81. This value and this has a difference of 0.19 and this value and this has, a, these are the differences here. Okay, so then um, we're gonna take these residuals and we're gonna fit, um, fit a tree to that. Okay, so taking these values, what is the tree that we're gonna get? This time, the split will happen between X being two and three. Okay, so if I if I try to fit a tree, just a single stump of a tree here, 
um, we're going to create the split at between two and three. And, um, and the value we would predict over here is negative 1.8. And the value we predict over here is 1.2. And so um, trying to predict these values, these would be our new values that we would predict. So we take all of our adjust adjustments and we, um, uh, we multiply that by our learning rate of 0.3. So our new predicted values here are going to be uh, 2.267. So all, all to illustrate is that as you do boosting with um, with each tree that we we run, um, we're just making small incremental adjustments. Okay. Uh, the comparison I like to make is, you know, when you're trying to take a shower, <laughs> um, if the water feels like the wrong temperature okay you can try drastically swinging or i mean sometimes you maybe your shower just works this way you know you, you adjust the knob and it goes suddenly from super hot to super cold or from super cold to super hot okay and boosting tries to avoid this by saying you know what when you change the temperature like if you if the values are if the value you're predicting is too high or too low don't just go for the direct adjustment. Don't say that the adjustment I need is to add four, okay? Um, only do a tiny incremental adjustment. And so it'd be like just brushing it up against that temperature knob just so that it adjusts just the teeniest bit, okay? And so, you know, maybe it's too cold and you just touch the knob and it's still too cold, but you're getting um, a little bit of slightly warmer, okay? And, um, and so boosting says, you know what, don't say where, um, how much do I need to adjust and say, I need to, you know, uh, increase my temperature this much, but we're gonna just make tiny, tiny incremental adjustments using the learning rate. So rather than saying, um, you know, we're off by four, so let's add four to our values. We're gonna add 1% of four, okay? And so that increments um, our prediction just a tiny bit. And, and then we say, okay, now that we've improved my predictions a tiny bit, let's reevaluate and let's see how much I need to uh, improve my um, predictions. And, uh, and that's kind of the idea of boosted trees, right? Creates a, a, a series of decision trees. All, each tree depends on the results of the pre previous tree. And again, the, uh, the estimates require a learning rate, which says, you know, this is how much we, uh, we make our adjustments. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of how boosted trees would work. Um, and so here I tried, um, I used a GBM and, um, That's not an option for, um, you got light GBM, but uh, the, the, the formula I used here is not, um, not available. And so um, again, I, I'm sorry, I didn't ad adapt this for, um, for tidy models. And so in order to kind of reproduce the same results, I had to specify all of these different arguments here. Um, number of trees and then, shrinkage and bag fraction. And, um, and here, this shows kind of the predictions that, uh, that we would get if I used this, this particular model, okay? Um, which aligns with the predictions made uh, over here. Um, and this is kind of the result. Uh, the result's not very good. <laughs> Okay, our, our toy boosting model is uh, not, not close to being done. Um, it's, it's not, uh, not performing well, but, uh, but it does, um, it kind of shows a little bit of how it's starting to uh, kind of make adjustments. And as, as time goes on, as we fit more and more of these sequential trees, this prediction, which is currently, it's currently predicting 6.147, 
it would end up kind of pushing it higher and higher to the correct value. Uh, okay, that's um, that's it for the uh, the lecture notes that I have uh, prepared uh, at this moment. Um, I don't know if you had questions regarding um, the homework, uh, and I uh, spoke to uh, spoke to your TA. You can actually thank Andrew for um, uh, he he contacted me and suggested I adjust the uh, the homework three deadline. So so I took his uh, his suggestion under advisement. And, uh, and so um, extended uh, the homework three deadline. And then, um, and yeah, um, uh, he was working on getting the, uh, the tuning um, parameters set up for hyper, um, picking your hyper parameters when you select a model. And, uh, and I think he'll, he'll show some examples um, in, uh, in discussion, but, um, but yeah, we'll, um, We'll wrap it up here. Let me give you your last view quiz answer, which is the letter B, B as in bear. And um, if you have any questions, um, you know, I'll stick around for office hours to, uh, um, I don't know, address any uh, questions or concerns you have. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up here. Um, have a good rest of your day. Good luck as you continue working on, um, the Kaggle competition. And, uh, and again, I will post up the secondary um, competition on Kaggle as well and send out a link once, uh, once I have that done. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. We'll uh, see, you, see you later.